Oh. And it, it had it was a it was a fascinating website. It had um, it had uh, like the staff of the battalion all the way back to the 1800s. No kidding. Yeah. I didn't it was called the Battalion Hall of Fame. I've never tried to. I'm going to have to try to get on that. And it had a list of the staff of battalion. I mean, every year back to 1890 something, My something like that. Gosh. Oh yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's oh. pretty, it pretty amazing. Yeah, I'll just sit over here. Okay. Very good. I'm just going to uh, right there, and, and we'll visit. Well, I was managing editor of the bat, but that was way back in 1947 or 8, 48, yeah. I guess it was. Right. You were class of '47, right? Right. Uh huh. So, uh, but that. When did you actually graduate? Actually, graduated '49. '49. Okay. Typically, most most yeah. all of my class <coughs> did about the same thing as I did. We went in the military. Sure. Just after or shortly after the finishing our our freshman year, and then. Uh, so you started in. Started in fall of '43. '43. Yeah. And then uh, went in the military then the summer of '44. Right. And then came back in '46 and right. finished in '49. Well, tell me where you started out. Where'd you grow up, and and sort of what was your path to A and M, and okay. and then into the military. Okay, uh, I was born in Iowa, Cherokee, oh. Iowa. What part of the state is that? Oh, that's up close, fairly close to Sioux City, up in the north, the northwest corner. Northwest corner. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, right not so terribly far from Omaha. Right. <clears throat> that general vicinity. Right. Right. Well, I asked because my wife was born in. Uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Fort Dodge. Oh, she was. Yeah, yeah, my wife was born in Fort Dodge. Yeah, more toward the central part of the state. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Her, yeah, right. Well, m all of my all of my mother's uh, family lived in uh, the center part of the state. Mm -hmm. um, Ames and Story City and that right. area. Right. And Ames, of course, you you've been there many times. Oh yeah, Iowa sure. State being there. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, uh, my dad. Uh, lived in Cherokee. Mm -hmm. They met when they were in college, way way back when, yeah. and uh, got married. And uh, then my dad died when I was three years old. I see. And uh, my mother remarried after about a year. So, uh, the, her new husband, my stepfather, uh, was an undertaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, no, not too long after they married, what he sold his funeral home in Cherokee, and we moved to Marshalltown. I see. And um, then we lived there, and then, oh heaven's sakes, just in the middle of the Depression, he ended up having all sorts of financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. We moved all over the state, it seemed like. And then finally, when I was 10, in 36, we moved to Texas. And uh, he was uh, he was teaming up with uh, with a uh, another undertaker who was a friend of his in World War One, mm -hmm. and they were going to build a funeral home in Oregon, someplace in Oregon. I have no idea where. And the snows came early that year, blocked all the mountain passes in Colorado and Wyoming, so we couldn't. They couldn't uh, drive from Iowa to um, Oregon uh -huh. without going the southern route through Texas. And um, we got to Texas. Yeah, we've been eating eating uh, all of our meals on the highway, right, alongside the road roadside parks. And. Um, so uh, we stayed, my kid brother and I thought that we were on just one long picnic. <laughs> not realizing we were traveling like a bunch of gypsies. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so we stopped in Pecos one afternoon to get a dime's worth of paper plates. Right. And then eat on the way someplace out in the desert west of there on the way to El Paso. And uh, when he was parked in front of the variety store, there was a um, um, lawyer in town who happened to be from Iowa, saw the Iowa license plates. Don't see many Iowa license plates in West Texas in 1936. <laughs> no, I bet not. So um, he hailed him and uh, they visited for a while. Turned out they had a lot of mutual friends. And uh, he took uh, he took Dad over to the uh, Pecos Furniture Store, which uh, was also part of the same group that owned the Pecos Funeral Home. And uh, to make a long story short, he was ultimately offered a job, and he accepted, and we ended up staying in Pecos. In Pecos. So, uh, I'll be darned. So I went to high school and grew up in Pecos uh -huh. from the time I was 10 to the time I was 17, graduated from high school, and came to a and I see. And uh, every summer I'd go back to Iowa, work yeah. on farms of different uncles up there. Right. In the summer, after I graduated from high school, I was, uh, what I really wanted to do was to go to West Point. 
but I had absolutely no idea how to how to go to West Point. And my mother and dad were of no help whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I tried to volunteer while I was in high school for uh, several different Navy and Marine Corps uh, projects, and um, they refused to sign the papers because <laughs> I was too young. And um, so anyway, West Point was what I wanted to do then. No idea how to do it. But I knew that A&M was a military school, and uh, so since I couldn't go to West Point, didn't know how to get there. And I didn't know how to get to A&M, <laughs> although I'd never been here before. Uh -huh. So uh, that's what I did, yeah. I came to A&M. Made that decision that summer, working up on the farm up in Iowa. Up in Iowa, uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, applied and was accepted. Of course, at that time, I think they'd accept anybody. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, arrived. So that was 1943. 43. So the, uh -huh. Right. So the war was, was going. Oh, yeah. The war was started, yeah. started um, a little over a year before uh -huh. that. Right. Sure. And um, so, um, anyway, rode from, um, well, from Pecos to College Station on the train, got off at the old train station. Mm -hmm. The thing that gave and gave College Station its name, exactly. College Station, right? And uh, came in on the old Sunbeam, and um, spent my freshman year when we when the train stopped there. By the way, um, here was a group of people out there waiting for us. I thought, boy, oh, what a fantastic thing! They're, they've got a welcoming committee and everything, and there was a whole car full of us uh, who were going to be freshmen coming in from Dallas at that yeah. point. Well, turn, it turned out they were a welcoming committee, but they weren't the sort that we thought they were. They were upperclassmen waiting for the fresh meat getting off that train. <laughs> 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 so that was my initiation to A&M. <laughs> and uh, after about six weeks, I absolutely <laughs> detested it, hated every bit of it. Uh -huh. uh, upperclassmen, everything about it. And I wrote my mother and dad, told them I made a big mistake and I wanted to come home. Mm -hmm. There were no phones on campus at that time, so I couldn't telephone. I couldn't afford it if I, if, if I could. So the only means of communication was by letter. Anyway, they never answered the letter. So I had to stay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> by the end of the semester, well, uh, I absolutely loved the place and have ever since. Uh -huh. and, and uh, never regretted a minute of it. <laughs> and that's really interesting. Well, I guess they had a, they probably had a method of not answering your letter, right? Uh, I, think that, 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 I think they let did. Let them stick it out. <laughs> I think they did. Yeah, right, right. They weren't going to rescue you. Uh, uh oh. Yeah, uh -oh. let's wait for his second letter. See if it's second letter. That's right. <laughs> so, sure enough, there wasn't one. <laughs> All right, and there, one didn't come. And um, so, anyway, I went in the Army then in uh, uh, that summer. 44, mm -hmm. right after the, the right after your freshman year. ending my first year, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and um, <coughs> pardon me, went to um, went to um, El Paso, the uh, induction center, and then from there, then to Fort Hood or Camp Hood at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, went through basic Camp Hood mm -hmm. because I had ROTC training. Why uh, I was made an acting squad leader in basic training, so I had a black armband with three stripes on the thing. Right. And um, so um, that worked out great. I got out of a few extra details like that. Mm -hmm. But then one night on a on a bivouac and a night maneuver, we were supposed to our platoon was supposed to attack a particular stone building on Cowhouse Creek in the middle of Fort Sam or Camp Camp. I mean, no, Camp Hood. At the Camp time. Hood. Okay. And um, so anyway, we had to wade crap Cowhouse Creek to get there. We were to be the uh, uh, the flanking attack, and another platoon of the or another squad of the platoon was setting up the base of fire. Well, we crossed Cowhouse Creek. This was night, remind uh, remind you, and we crossed it a second time. And about that time, why well, I heard the firing in the baseline, and sure enough, I knew we were lost. So I lost my I lost my. <laughs> my temporary stripes, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, anyway, finished <laughs> finished the camp hood, and um, uh, shipped overseas pretty quickly after that. Went overseas on uh, the Old Uh shipped out of Boston. You went to to Europe, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Old France was was um, one of the uh, one of the three or four largest ships in the world before the war. Mm -hmm. um, Beautiful luxury liner owned by the by the French, of course. 
And uh, after France fell, uh, it had been taken over then by the British. I think he was in uh, in uh, Portsmouth at the time that the French fell, that the right. French government fell. Right. So uh, it was sailing then as a as an, a British ship it had an English crew on board, uh, serving English food, uh -huh. and it was absolutely terrible on board. <laughs> and the this is summer forty four now still or no this this is the winter of forty four winter forty four okay. uh, and. Um, uh, we had um, had American gun crews on board, and uh, the ship was was one of the fast ones of it and the Saint and the um, uh, Queen Mary. Uh, typically sailed by themselves, not in convoy, because they could outrun a convoy in mm -hmm. uh, in the submarine supposedly. And I guess they did because they they both went back and forth many times safely. <laughs> but anyway, the, what was the name of the ship again? Ile de France. Ile de France. Okay. Uh -huh. The American gun crews would tell us every morning that, uh, well, there's a sub that was following us last night. They are trying to scare us. There wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't anything like that around. Yeah. Um, because were you zigzagging or? Uh, I have no idea. They, yeah. prob they probably were, but mm -hmm. I have no mm -hmm. idea. Though. Yeah. When uh, we boarded the, uh, the ship in, uh, in Boston Harbor along about six o'clock one night, and um, we, were, we were briefed beforehand that we'd be boarding the ship and go down in the hold, which is where they put us. Uh, there were about 20, right around 20,000 of us on board that ship, so we were packed in like sardines. It wasn't the luxury liner that it had <laughs> once been. And um, anyway, told us that we'd be sailing then that night. The next morning, when I woke up, the smell in that, that hold, that room was terrible. People were sick all over the place, seasick, just sick as could be, and I got up on deck as quickly as I could to get some fresh air. Tom, we were still tied up at the dock. <laughs> we had not moved, so it was all psychological. They'd been told that they were moving, so... <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was my first night not at sea. <laughs> <laughs> so, you were kind of worried about what it's going to be like. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that was the most eventful thing that happened. <laughs> we landed in Glasgow. Was it a rough? Was it a rough go? I mean, was no, it really what, wasn't. What, okay, because no. I hear stories about. Yeah, the North Atlantic can be pretty. Yeah, can be pretty, pretty rough, rough. But it, uh, it really wasn't. So you landed in Glasgow, Glasgow, uh -huh. Scotland. No. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And then um, uh, boarded boarded a train immediately, and we went went down to the southern coast. And I'm not really sure where it was that we landed, or where the train took us. Mm -hmm. I think it was Portsmouth, but I wouldn't swear to it. All right. And um, immediately boarded LSTs to uh, go across the channel in the LST. And um, uh, some really bad storms hit the channel, so they kept us in the LST then, and that was pretty rough. It was mm -hmm. going up and down pretty, pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. Kept us there for an extra day before the weather calmed down enough, and uh, then across the, to uh, La Havre, and um, went into a replacement depot in La Havre, and then um, from there on uh, uh, on board a boxcar and the 40 and 8, and uh, the boxcar then across France into uh, uh, another replacement depot or repo depot as they were called, mm -hmm. and then uh, at that point, well, I was assigned then to the 79th Infantry Division okay. and uh, 314th Infantry, so. Uh, Stayed there for oh just a just a few days, probably three or four days or so, at the most, if even that. And then uh, on trucks then to be trucked into our our outfit, and uh, my outfit was uh, F Company, uh, 314th Infantry Regiment, mm -hmm. 79th Division, and we were located in Hagenau, France at the time, mm -hmm. or right on the edge of it. And uh, the company had uh, had. Uh, been up, that, that's very close to the German lines, it's um, the German border, it's um, in the Alsace-Lorraine area, mm -hmm. in, uh, in what was uh, referred to by some as the Colmar Pocket, where the Germans had broken through and created a pocket there, kind of like the one up in, in Belgium, mm -hmm. at the same time of the, uh, uh, that the Belgian bulge was created, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this was at that time. So uh, anyway, the the outfit had been up there and then then been pushed back again. It had uh, lost pretty heavily at that point. So I was one of the replacements who came in then. All right. Um, we were there for uh, 
oh, in defensive positions for a period of um, probably a couple of weeks, something like that. And then um, we were moved back to a rest area in Nancy, France, or Nancy. And um, we were there for a few days. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, I was listening to uh, Axis Sally one night. And uh, Axis Sally always had oh, beautiful music, good old jazz and swing music, the type of things that, that we all love to hear. Right. So we'd listen to her program then for the music. <coughs> and, um, and she'd always throw in some extra propaganda, too. This one particular night where she said uh, words to the effect, you boys in the 79th, put your cross Lorraine back on. Uh, you're in Nancy and you're going north. And um, we had no idea where we were going. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, she hit it on the button. We, that's where we were and sure enough, we were going north. Mm -hmm. And uh, loaded us on trucks and, and we headed on up uh, into Belgium around and came around then on the north side of the bulge and uh, part of the pincher movement coming in we were moved from the seventh army by the way to the ninth army and then Patton was in, coming in from the south and then we in the ninth army from the north mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, of the biggest the biggest fight that we got into at that at that time in that area was uh, a town of Kempen, right on the Belgian-German line, or close to that, on the, it was on the Roar River. Mm -hmm. And um, the purpose of that, the battle there, was to take um, take uh, take over the Roar River, up and down the line of the Roar, and then um, open the way through the plains of Cologne then to uh, capture Cologne, mm -hmm. and then bring the forces in up on the Rhine River. So um, anyway, that, that happened, and we were... Um, we attacked Campen, captured Campen, and um, I guess it was that night after after the, the the battle itself lasted for a little over a day, and it was at the end of that that night uh, we had possession of the town and all, and um, the tanks would come roaring up to the to us and to the edge of the of the river, then they turn around as quietly as the tank can go, they move back again. Then they come roaring up, making all the noise they could make, coming back up again. So the, this obviously was, was a feint to give the Germans the idea they were reinforcing us there at that point. Mm -hmm. And it uh, turned out that, that um, our regiment had gone into the line replacing the 35th Division. So the regiment was replacing a division on, on the front there. And the 35th had gone around then to the right of us, and they did made the main effort then crossing the the roar with uh, the German forces primarily opposite us in camping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was a pretty good fainting maneuver. Yeah. And they crossed the roar there, and then, and, uh, and then everybody moved across then to uh, uh, to the Rhine River then shortly after that. We were pulled back later on then to uh, uh, an area just outside of Maastricht, Holland, to practice river crossings on the Moss River. And uh, so uh, this was in preparation for the Rhine crossing. Uh -huh. So while we were back there practicing river crossing, while uh, the First Army crossed on Remagen Bridge, <laughs> it was a big surprise, I'm sure, to everybody. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, the Third Army crossed then, and uh, and the Ninth Army was, was supposed to have been the major effort in the North. And the Ninth had been attached to Montgomery's Army Group at the time, mm -hmm. and so I've always thought that politically that was to give to give Montgomery <coughs> some additional political cover right. at that point. So right. he was to command the major effort. Right. And um, uh, so um, anyway, we were we spearheaded the Ninth Army across the Rhine then, but it was several days after. Uh, the other armies had crossed, so as a consequence, what, it wasn't the big deal that Montgomery was expecting to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he didn't quite get the same publicity out of it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the night before we crossed, we were, um, the crossing was to begin at uh, like 6 o'clock in the morning, and uh, uh, the, uh, our company commander, a guy named Palmer, had uh, called a company meeting, and uh, uh, we were all gathered then beside or right behind a dike on the edge of the river. 
and um, he said, uh, man, we're not going to Shirley Temple's birthday party. <laughs> I'll never forget him saying that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so uh, we crossed the Rhine, and sure enough, it was like Shirley Temple's birthday party. Um, there wasn't anything there until after we got across. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things that helped there, we had a, there was a two-hour artillery serenade before we jumped off. And this was one of the things that Montgomery, I think, typically did. He was a heavy a believer in a lot of heavy artillery use. And um, so um, just all up and down the line for a solid two hours, nothing but just one solid roar. You just can't imagine how, how noisy, how loud that was. Just roar all the way up and down the line. And um, something like 2,000 artillery pieces on, I've heard later on were involved in that. So uh, anyway, we crossed the Rhine uh, very uneventfully, and uh, the first, oh, the first sign of, of uh, combat in any way at all was probably a hundred yards on the other side of the river, mm -hmm. and um, then we started taking fire, mm -hmm. and uh, and I saw a dead German along the way, and saw a couple of dead Americans mm -hmm. along the way. Uh, these one of them was uh, from the 17th Airborne. Um, I think that it had dropped in before us, a little bit before us. And um, so anyway, the day proceeded and um, and by that <coughs> night, well, we were probably um, well, we were probably a half a mile on the other side of the, of the river. And um, the Germans started tra strafing the, uh, the engineers attempting to build a bridge across to us. And they did get the bridge across the following day. Um, we could see the ra the tracers, the airplanes coming in, diving, dive bombing, and firing, firing tracers as well as dropping bombs. Mm -hmm. And we could see artillery tracers going up, and I could never imagine why it was that they never hit any of the planes. <laughs> they were always going way, way ahead of where they were, mm -hmm. and they weren't going that fast. They weren't going to run into anything. But anyway, we didn't see a plane go down. We saw a lot of artillery tracers going up. <laughs> oh, yeah. So a strange sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty much regular infantry, infantry tactics and combat from that time on for a bit. Right. Um, I might mention a couple of things. That and you were a ground soldier. Mm -hmm. You were carried a rifle. Carried a rifle, and then I was I was in the um, uh, later on in the mortar squad. Okay. And I became a squad leader in, in the mortar squad and also a section chief of the mortar section. What kind of mortar? 4.2 or? No, no. A little, little bitty 6 millimeter. Okay. 60 millimeter. I see. The, that the rifle company had. I see. The uh, Each rifle company had three rifle platoons and one weapons platoon. Mm -hmm. The weapons platoon would have two sections, mortars and machine guns. And there'd be three mortar squads and right. three machine gun squads. And these were 30 caliber machine guns and mm -hmm. 60 millimeter mortar. You know, yeah. Shoot over the top of the house, basically. Right. And um, right. Okay. Um, at one point in, during the Battle of Camp, and I, I guess I should toss this in there, we were about to run out of ammunition at one point. And uh, so uh, our platoon leader asked for <coughs> volunteers to go, go back to regiment then to pick up uh, to the regimental. Uh, ammunition dump to pick up some supplies, some ammunition, and, um, and so I volunteered. And um, a guy named Leo Lincoln from Los Angeles uh, agreed to go with me. And we were young kids, 19 years old, and um, we were still. I was still 18 at the time; hadn't turned 19 yet. And um, uh, walking down this 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 country road. And it had rained like crazy a few days before that, so everything was all muddy. But that particular day, though, uh, the sun was shining, it was a pretty day. We were walking down the road, and of all the crazy things, we started singing Stormy Weather. So the two of us were singing Stormy Weather, walking on down the, <laughs> the road then to, towards regiment to pick up the ammunition. And um, we were told that we'd have, uh, have fire support from the heavy 50 caliber machine guns of the uh, of battalion, and they'd be firing over our head then uh, to keep anything down from, from going after us when we were, uh, as we were doing that. 
and we could hear these things snapping and cracking over our heads. Finally, after a certain period of time, we were singing and kind of having a good time. That's that's why 18-year-olds are the ones that go in to fight wars because they never think that anything could ever happen to exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. And um, then it suddenly dawned on us those machine guns were firing from the wrong direction. That wasn't our fire we heard. Oh my that was that was a German fire. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we immediately then got down on the ditch alongside of the <laughs> of the road. Right. <laughs> and. Um, Evidently, they could not lower their guns enough to take us out of the ditch. So yeah. we made it back and got the ammunition and came back. Wow. And um, so um, after that, what? Uh, my squad leader and, and our platoon leader, company commander, then recommended me then for a Bronze Star, which which eventually caught up with me after the war was over with. Uh -huh, I see. So, um, or I guess that's when it came. They yeah. told me. They turned it in then, and I eventually right. got one. Um, anyway, the old, one little funny thing that happened at Kempen was uh, we had a brand new second lieutenant who'd been assigned to the outfit, <clears throat> and he was our he was our new platoon leader, and uh, working under the direction of our platoon sergeant actually, because he knew <laughs> he knew what was going on. And anyway, this this guy seemed to be a he's really going to be a, a good guy. And at one point, after things had really quieted down, it looked as though the, the fight was, was over with, he had to go to the bathroom, something awful. And there were no bathrooms around. And there was a clump of bushes and some trees nearby, so he went in there and he dropped his, dropped his pants. Mm -hmm. And about that time, a sniper, who I think was probably up in a church tower, that was usually where they liked to be, and we'd typically knock a church tower out of the way just to eliminate those things, but this yeah. one was still standing. A uh, sniper picked up and started shooting at him. He came running out of the bush with his pants around his legs like that, and he said, man, that's the first time I've ever been caught with my pants down, literally. <laughs> which, oh which, my God. which really and truly endeared him to, to us. Yeah. To make a joke out of something like that that yeah. happened to him. Oh. And, uh, but then about a month after that, well, uh, he ended up having battle fatigue and was sent back then. I see. And um, the last thing that I know what he said when he left was kind of jabbering and said, I hope they don't refer me or reduce me to a civilian status. I, and the poor guy, I don't know whatever happened to him. I mean, that. I uh, mean, anyway, we... Uh, I see another medal up there that I'm waiting for you to tell me about. Uh, <laughs> oh, the, the purple one. Yeah. To me, the most important one up there is that combat infantry badge. I see. Okay. And uh, that's on the bottom left. No, or, that's the top one. Oh, okay, the top. Yeah, okay. No, uh -huh. the bottom left is um, expert. expert yeah, the rock. Rock. Yeah, uh -huh. one. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, how the purple heart come about? Uh, well, this is after we crossed the Rhine. We were going mm -hmm. uh, going through uh, an industrial area. Mm -hmm. We are on the north side of the Ruhr Pocket, uh, the Ruhr Valley at that time, which became the Ruhr Pocket. And uh, we're in the vicinity of Duisburg, and uh, going through um, uh, a huge factory of some sort, and uh, uh, the Germans started shelling us in there pretty heavily. And uh, so um, uh, I took refuge in a, in a bunker, mm -hmm. and uh, just so happened that a shell Shell came down. I was uh, watching through a uh, through a slit in the bunker, firing slit actually, and because uh, typically the Germans would would uh, <coughs> follow up a barrage like that with a counterattack. Mm -hmm. and of course, we would precede one of our attacks with with a barrage quite often. So anyway, watching through there then for a counterattack, and uh, and a shell of all things came right on there and it burst right there at that slit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, you know, the, the bunker that I was in was all filled with smoke and everything, and I knew something had happened. I yelled, at a, yelled for a medic and uh, put my hands out in front of my face. The first thing I wanted to see, be sure that I could see, I wasn't blind. It was all dark and smoky and all. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I could see my hand, so that was a relief. And the next thing, Tom, the two things that a GI was always most concerned about, and that was eyes 
and genitals. Mm -hmm. And that was the next thing I reached to be mm -hmm. sure that everything was intact and it mm -hmm. was. That's <laughs> mm -hmm. something that um, I don't mention to many people, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, but nonetheless, that yeah. that was a fact. Sure. So um, anyway, the uh, medics came and they sent me back to back to the aid station and and then on back to the hospital. I was only in the hospital for a couple of weeks. It turned out they thought that I had a punctured lung. But I didn't though. Um, it was I had shell fragments in in my shoulder back here. When I heard the shell coming in, I turned quickly because you can you could hear them coming in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had shell fragments back here in my shoulder, and also cuts on the side of my head up here by my eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the scars are just back on now. Mm -hmm. And um, when they determined that there was no lungs punctured or anything, why? Uh, Pretty easily patched things up, and yeah. and um, so I was back on my way to the lines in before too long. I see. So where were you treated? Um, some place on the um, don't know exactly where, but it was some place so in um, either in the area to the west of um, of Cologne or mm -hmm. is in Belgium. Right. And not really sure. Right. Which one? Right. It was. Um, it took a day on a on a truck to get back, get from where we were, uh, to the Rhine, and then took another day on a truck then to rejoin my outfit. Right. And so, um, or about a half a day, I guess it was. Now during the what? We're we're in the winter of '45 now. Is that mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Uh -huh. During the during the bulge. Right. Mm -hmm. Only thing I've ever heard about people who were involved in the Battle of the Bulge was. Uh, one of the main things I've heard is about the weather, cold and how cold it was. I mean, cold as it could be. Can't ever hmm. describe I've, exactly. I've heard uh, heard other stories yeah. that uh, that it was a record breaking cold winter. Right. And I don't know if it's been surpassed now or not, but it was the coldest winter on on record that right. particular time. So you know, weather services have said. And, and you were a ground soldier, so you were mm -hmm. you were you were tracing through the snow a lot. Mm -hmm. They gave us. Uh, they, the depiction they, of it in in, uh, in Band of Brothers is like have you seen Band of Brothers? No, the, uh, the uh, HBO show. The depiction of it is I've always been told is very, very real, mm -hmm. very you know, very much like it really was. And all I that. never I did particularly imagine. want to see uh, any yeah. of the war movies. Right. Um, yeah. I like to see Civil War movies, things yeah. like that. But yeah. But, but, I but yeah, yeah. Why would you watch it? You were there. You, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the only one that I've seen was. Um, was Saving Private Ryan, uh -huh. and I did go to see that. I wasn't going to, yeah. but um, but several people said that I should, yeah. and so I did. Yeah. And I'm I'm glad that I did go. Sure, it was the truest depiction that I could ever imagine. Uh -huh. um, I wasn't in the invasion on D-Day, so right. so I couldn't I couldn't vouch for that. But right. people who I knew who had been though yeah. uh, had described it to me, and it was just like that. And I do know how things were after that, and right. what they showed in in the movie was exactly what the way that I saw things afterwards. Exactly. So well, Band of Brothers is much like out. that too, from what I've been told. It's yeah. The, the yeah the it's it's as it was. Uh -huh. but, yeah. So uh, so go ahead. What after uh, pick it up from where we were? Well, after the uh, some some of these things get kind of confused to me mm -hmm. as to whether they came before or after some, some other events, but no, there are certain understand. events that would stand out. That stand yeah, out. sure. Um, one such event that really stands out was um, one particular night we had set up a defensive perimeter on the edge of a, of a German village and typically when we, when we do that we'd have we'd have foxholes out in front of the, of the houses there on the edge of the village line mm -hmm. and then um, uh, the village would be empty. There'd be no no people there, and um, we'd have uh, basements of some of the houses that we we would sleep in. And uh, so uh, anyway, one particular night we we moved into this particular house, and uh, so I went down to the basement then, and uh, found a comfortable bin of potatoes in to go to sleep in. So I curled up in the, the potato bin. I could move things around to make room for hips and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, slept well. The next morning, woke up. Turned out they weren't potatoes, but they were 
round German concussion grenades. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> he was a potato bin full of those crazy things. Uh -huh. yeah. So it was a good thing that we didn't have any uh, <laughs> shelling hit at that particular time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, oh, another time along about then, this was possibly the same, the same house, the same village. We had set up the perimeter of defense and uh, foxholes out and then people in the, in, the, in the houses and everything. And at that time, well, I was a uh, uh, squad leader in, in a mortar section. And uh, so uh, uh, we'd set a mortar up in back of this one particular house. We were firing, we could fire over the top of the house then. And uh, it was in the garden back there. And uh, we were supposed to be relieved that night by an L company. And uh, so about the time that we were supposed to be relieved, uh, flares started dropping and uh, and smoke smoke flares and light flares both. And um, here it turned out the Germans started a counterattack and they were coming across the field and towards us. Well, in the meantime, here was L Company coming up to relieve us. So uh, it was really a mixed up sort of a situation there. And then it started raining on top of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, uh, I had the, my gunner for the squad and also the uh, assistant gunner and the ammo bearers um, out doing other things. And somebody was out in the foxholes and in uh, outposts and the whole bit. So I ran back to the garden then to uh, put the uh, cover on the mortar tube and uh, ran out there and I heard somebody called Hobbs. And so I thought it was our platoon sergeant calling me. And I turned around, I headed on back, and um, he hadn't called. So I turned around, headed back again, and I heard this again, Hobbs, and turned around and, uh, what, who's calling me? Nobody was. So I went out the third time, and then I heard the same, heard the same word, and I heard a metallic click of the safety going off an M1, which is very un unmistakable if you you know what <laughs> you've been around mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and there was a GI there from L Company, mm -hmm. and he thought I was one of the German infiltrator or German attackers coming through there. And um, so um, the only thing I could think of at that particular point, I completely forgot the password. And the only thing I could think of was to let loose the longest, longest cuss, string of cuss words I could think of to identify myself as an American, not mm -hmm. a German. Mm -hmm. And uh, he cussed me back and said that I came within <laughs> whatever of, of him pulling the trigger on that right. M1 because he thought I was the other guy. Yeah. Wow. So that that uh, that was something we laughed about afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, uh, I think he was. Probably not too many days after that, we were going down. A, so often our attacks would come at night, and we were attacking down uh, the edge of, uh, or following the edge of a, of a road, came to a railroad, and uh, so we turned left to follow the railroad. And um, uh, we had arrangements. I, I always had a case of night blindness. And we had arrangements. The guy who typically walked in front of me in a, in a line such as that, at night would have a pair of heavy white socks on his rifle belt in the back so I could see these white spots up in front of me mm -hmm. and following. And I should have had some on the back of mine because the guys in back of me turned right instead of turned left. Wow. And um, there were um, three or four of them, I forget which now, uh, that ended up then when they finally realized that there was nobody in front of them. They went into the nearest house they saw, and uh, which was vacant, of course, and uh, went down to the basement and uh, stayed down there. The next, next morning, why, um, or early in the next morning, sometime after they moved in there, they could hear voices up above. They were German voices. And uh, they'd gone the wrong direction, got behind German lines, and the Germans set up a machine gun in the doorway of that house up there but for some crazy reason, they never went down in the <coughs> cellar to check out the house, which I can't imagine because that's the first thing we would have done going into a house is check everything out. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, the Germans are up there with a the machine gun and here are these, these three or four Americans holed up down in the cellar <laughs> and there wasn't very much they could do about that. 
um, after uh, oh most of that day, I guess, sometime late that evening, why the Germans left, and then um, uh, an American outfit came moving in there. So they basically got back to our outfit then mm -hmm. after spending mm, several days that were in the wrong place. <laughs> they, they wish they hadn't been afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're the things that really stand out the most are things that later on in looking back seem kind of humorous. Mm -hmm. Like those guys make the wrong turn and everything. Right, right. Um, when the war ended, mm -hmm. we were in Essen and um, it was winding down and we were moved then to Dortmund as part of the cleanup of the Ruhr Valley. And uh, we were in Dortmund on May the 8th, the time that uh, that the war did end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard on the radio, I heard uh, Winston Churchill's speech on declaring victory. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, I'll never forget the way that he ended the thing. It was in his, his Churchillian way, advance Britannia, long live the cause of freedom, and God save the king. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It was it was really something. Oh, yeah. And um, so thank God it was over with. Yes. And we went from there then to uh, eager Czechoslovakia then on occupation. Uh huh. And um, we're there for a fairly short period of time guarding a, a German POW camp primarily. Mm -hmm. Then turned it over then to uh, uh, the Russians, and then moved back then into different different spots then back and forth right. throughout. The American what became the American zone of occupation then, and then uh, uh, in the just before the war ended in Japan, we were pulled out and sent to an assembly area. It was an old German uh, training camp, and uh, that assembly area was was where the whole division was put back together again at one point, instead of scattered out in different little towns around, and we were. To move to La Harve and then board ships in from uh, in La Harve for the states, mm -hmm. we re outfitted and everyone get have a chance for a leave and then uh, onto the Pacific, right. and um, so we were to be someplace over there for the invasion of Japan. Right, and um, thank God the the bombs were dropped. Right, <laughs> we right. were at that at that holding area when the bombs were dropped. Right, and um, when Japan surrendered. Right. Well, so you went home? Um, no. No, not yet. No. Uh, when the bombs were dropped, by the way, we heard about that. You'd never seen the likes of celebration. Uh -huh. Firing machine guns, guns, everything else up in the air. No right. consequence, no thought of consequences. Everything goes up, it's got to come down. Exactly. But like those crazy people in the Middle East do. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what we were doing. Yeah. And uh, a short time after that, uh, they uh, set up a, had, they had set up a point system to go home. Exactly. And um, so uh, those who had X number of points to go home, and I forget what it was, a hundred and some odd, to go home, uh, were sent into our division. We in turn were sent to the first division, those of us who didn't have enough points, and I had 45 or 50 or something. Uh, we were sent to the first division then for occupation until Mm -hmm. It was our time to go home. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I was there for you know, another, mm, gee whiz, another eight or nine months after that. I see. And uh, while I was there, a uh, fun thing that happened was uh, our company commander and uh, later on battalion commander agreed with him that uh, it'd be a fun thing to keep keep the GIs off the streets and everything by giving them something else to do. So they set up a, the idea of having a soldier, a soldier show contest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I got into one of the acts that our company had and uh, as one of the Andrews sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we lip sync to Andrews sister uh -huh. music. Uh -huh. Boogie Woogie Bugle right. Boy. Bugle Boy, you're right. <laughs> and, uh, Were you dressed up? And, uh, oh yeah. You are? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Are but, there any pictures of that? Yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, anyway, we ended up uh, 
uh, ultimately being part of uh, a st first division soldier show that was set up then. Yeah. It was called um, uh, You've Had It Joe. I see. And uh, it was a variety act. Yeah. Uh, our Andrew Sisters act was in it. And then I did the Frank Sinatra act then on top of that. Uh -huh. And sang Nancy with the Laughing Face. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> with that, what? They nailed a, a pair of oversized GI boots to a plank, and then uh, they bring this plank uh, on out uh, with, before the curtain is drawn, and I could step into it. They tie up tie up my shoes in with my feet into into the shoes on this plank, uh -huh. and then I could lean in exaggerated motions, do the things that Sinatra used to do as a young man. Yeah, lean all. The way down like that, this way, this way, and back and forth. <laughs> really exaggerate everything. So not uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh -huh. Now, where were you most of these eight months? Were you moving around, or were you pretty much in one spot? No, no, we were moving around. Yeah. We had a we had a tour bus, and, uh -huh. and we were a, a moving tour there yeah, for <laughs> about three months. I'll be darned. And uh, had a good time. That's we a great story. The, yeah. Put on the, the show in the Nuremberg Opera House, and uh, uh -huh. uh, most every place was in an opera house. Right. And uh, Regensburg, Wurzburg, uh -huh. so many of the birds that were yeah. in that area of the Southern Rhine. Sure. And uh, we spent Christmas, that Christmas in uh, Regensburg, and uh, there we were being outfitted with new stage equipment and everything, and uh, picked up a woman who would. Uh, be with us in so she could play some of the some of the female parts and a couple of the acts that had, mm -hmm. that had guys playing the part of girls and uh, not ours but but some other things mm -hmm. and uh, her name is Judy Mitchum she was Robert Mitchum's sister I see and uh, she uh, she was telling us about how she was the one who got her brother involved in the movies uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, otherwise why well, he was 4 so he couldn't be in the military I guess and, he hadn't he hadn't done We've Never Been Licked yet, had he? No. By then. Okay. <laughs> or had it. No, I guess he hadn't done that yet. No, at this point. <laughs> yeah, he did. He I did We've Never Been Licked in 1942. Oh, okay, so he had so already he had done already it. Done he it. She was the one who had gotten him in okay. the movies. And to, I see. Okay, yeah, that's, right. Like that. that's right. He had already done it. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, so anyway, we did that. But one kind of interesting thing while we were there at Regensburg, we were there over Christmas. And um, uh, those civilian actors, technicians, as they were called, mm -hmm. Julie and, and the others, cats, uh, put on a, a big Christmas uh, program for us and a Christmas party. And uh, they invited you know, nurses who were stationed nearby and, and uh, you know, any American girls that, that could be around there, whether it be in USO groups or mm -hmm. nurses or whatever, to come to dance with us and the dance that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two other shows that were there being equipped with new equipment at that time. And one of them was uh, uh, Tommy Kelly uh, and the Brother Rat show. Mm -hmm. And Kelly was the guy who had played uh, the part of Huck Finn in the movie Tom Sawyer that was made back yeah. in the 30s. Right. And just a real fine kid. He was just a little bit older than, than most of us. Right. Most of us were, you know, by that time, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. And another one who was there was Mickey Rooney with his show. Oh, darn. And Mickey Rooney was an absolute complete jerk. Is that right? <laughs> oh, he was. Oh, my goodness. He was so so full of himself. Uh-huh. And the funny thing about it was, uh, or sort of, in a way, pathetic in another way, at that uh, that big Christmas party dance that, uh, uh, that the cats put on for us, here was Rooney sitting at a table all by himself. Nobody, nobody wanted to associate with him, uh -huh. and everybody else would have a good time. Yeah, but he was that way. I think maybe he might have learned a lesson at that time. I see. So he may have he may have grown up a bit. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, after that one, uh, they gave us a uh, uh, <coughs> kind of a thank you sort of a thing. It was a lot of fun to do all this, but they gave us a. Pass took us took us through Switzerland and down into Rome and uh, you know passed on through the northern part of Italy. Spent time in, in Milano, then in Rome, then on back again. It's right. It's kind of a thank you, kind of a treat for it. So right. that was fun. 
got back to the outfit, and shortly after I got back, why <coughs> they, uh, um, I was given an opportunity to go to uh, First Division Rest Center then, which was in um, uh, just outside of Garmisch Partenkirchen in the 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 Alps, the mm -hmm. Bavarian Alps, and uh, uh, this is at at a hotel there, Lake Ipsy Hotel. It was operated by the First Division for the Rest Center. And it was specifically for enlisted men and run by enlisted men. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was asked if I would like to stay and be the provost sergeant in charge of all their guards and all for uh, about six weeks. So I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, it was during the winter time, still snow on the ground, so I could learn how to ski, which I did, mm -hmm. and uh, had a great time there. And uh, the German prisoners that we were guarding were political prisoners. I see. And um, these were people who'd been in lower level positions in government. And uh, one particular guy who I met uh, was a former equivalent of a district attorney. And um, oh, I got a painting from him that I traded cigarettes for, and he made some oh, some carved carved pictures and all mm -hmm. that. So. Uh, Anyway, did that for six weeks, came back to the outfit, not long after that I went back home. Went back home. Got back home and, and re-enrolled in A&M that fall and, uh -huh. and went, came on through A&M and was in the Corps again. Has it been the fall of 45? Fall of 46. 46, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah 46, right. Okay. And um, I spent the first semester back uh, as a civilian student mm -hmm. in non-reg and it just wasn't like A and M, so I got back in the corps. I see. And um, and I did like the military. Right. And um, so anyway, um, stayed in the corps, graduated. Um, went in, got got a commission in the Air Force. Went in the Air Force in during the Korean War. So I was in the Air Force for about four years after that. So I, I see. Two years in the infantry in World War Two, then four years in the Air Force and the Korean War. Uh -huh. I was uh, an intelligence officer in the Air Force. I see. And uh, we had uh, we had, de had a detachment headquarters at an air base near London, Skullthorpe, uh, between London and the Wash up in the northeastern part of, of England, and uh, well, pretty much east central part. And uh, uh, we'd fly out of there. and. Uh, uh, our outfit was flying RB-45s, and this is a reconnaissance plane. It was a reconnaissance wing, strategic reconnaissance. And uh, so during the course of things, what, um, we also uh, had uh, had teamed up with uh, with an RAF group that was there. And at one particular point, what, well, backing up just a notch, the, the uh, uh, outfit was was charged with the responsibility of photo mapping all of Western Europe at that point. Mm -hmm. And then later on it was extended then to photo map all of Europe on back to the Urals. And of course that included flying over Russia mm -hmm. and the quite a bit of Russia going back to the Urals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, at the point where they were flying deep in Russian territory uh, just to make things a little less likely that World War III could result. Um, these we brought a group of, of RAF pilots over to our base in this country, which happened at that time to be Barksdale, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they they learned how to fly the the 45, and then we went back over there again then, and, and um, I was I stayed there as the intelligence officer while the rest of the Americans came back again. Uh, our operations officer. Detachment commander and, and I stayed, and then the RAF then took over the air crew positions, and they actually photo mapped the rest of Russia, on up to the Urals around the area of Sverdlovsk, and this was um, preceding the Gary Powers situation by uh, a number of years, mm -hmm. and um, uh, where he was shot down was over Sverdlovsk in the Urals, which was just about the limit of where where our photo mapping ended then at that point. Right. And um, later on, after I came back and, and did all sorts of other things and came back to A&M, um, I ended up going to Sverdlovsk at one point. I see. And uh, 
was in a hotel just a couple of blocks away from the place where Gary Powers was uh, held as a prisoner. And I couldn't help but think at the time that <laughs> how ironic that particular situation was. Right. Wow. But uh, wow. Anyway, that was so you were in the Air Force during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. So were you? Did, were you did you go to Korea? Or you were, were you, no. You didn't no. go to Korea. Okay. I was, I was uh, immediately assigned to SAC. Okay. And uh, and uh, uh, as an intelligence officer, yeah, I was put where where the, I was needed otherwise, right. as far as they were concerned. Exactly. And uh, and we ended up spending up all of my overseas time in back and forth, going back and forth to England. All right. All um, right. These detachments over there. So, you're talking about. So, so the you war finished was here, and I was there. Right. Yeah. So you finished at A and M, and then where did in, your career in the Air Force? In the Air Force. Uh -huh. How long were you in the Air Force? Four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then what happened after that? Came out of there and uh, came out of the Air Force and uh, uh, got a job first with uh, oh, with a company down in Houston, the uh, Connecticut General Insurance Company, mm -hmm. selling insurance. And mm -hmm. uh, several friends of mine were were with them. Mm -hmm. uh, Creed Ford, who you may know, <clears throat> uh, you know the Creed, probably know the Creed Ford, who owns the uh, the restaurant so uh, oh, Arizona, yeah. right? And Johnny Carinas right. and so on. Sure. Well, his his dad was in my outfit at A and M. So, I see. Uh, so Laura and I have known Creed since he was about this big. <laughs> uh huh. And uh, anyway, Creed worked for uh, Connecticut General in that office, right. and uh, it was full of Aggies. So uh, they convinced me that's what I should do—go to work for them. Uh -huh. So I did. Hated every minute of it, uh -huh. but I gave it a year. Yeah. Didn't like it. Then. Uh, uh, went to work with Procter and Gamble, and I spent a number of years with Procter and Gamble in different uh, managerial spots and, uh -huh. and training jobs. And then, um, is this in Houston still? Uh, no, Houston then moved up to Dallas. I see. And um, then traveled back and forth to Cincinnati. I was teaching in the their management development program in Cincinnati, and um, then left Procter and joined two other. Uh, former Proctor managers who uh, ran a food brokerage company in, in Dallas and joined them and, and uh, uh, set up a, a new division then specializing in non-foods and uh, health beauty aids and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we ended up being one of the largest in the country doing that, had a heck of a lot of fun doing it. So I retired in, in uh, 85. 86 it was, retired in 86. From p &G. No, no, from, oh. from uh, our brokerage company. Right, right, I'm sorry, yeah. And um, uh, I was offered a job at A&M teaching management. So I, see. Uh, so I uh, took it and we moved down here and so I taught in the management department and then I was director of the Center for Executive Development for five years in uh -huh. the College of Business. Right. And then retired from that then uh, in 1990. Five. I see. And so you've been really retired since since ninety five. Uh, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> I, I continued teaching a course for about five years. Is that right? It, but uh, as a volunteer, I didn't want to have to go to meetings. So if I weren't on a payroll, they couldn't let me go to a meeting. So because <laughs> they, they could really fire you. Right? <laughs> That's right. So um, so anyway, I did that for about five years, and. Uh -huh. and uh, also was able to maintain an office on campus that way, and that was handy. Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, but then I, I did drop the class, so finally, after right. about five years of it, it was reached the point it was really beginning to interfere with some things we wanted to do on weekends. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah, I understand. And, I understand. Uh, so, when were you, when did you and Laura get married? We got married in 1948. 1948. So. Uh, while I was in school. Yeah. Uh huh. I was a, a junior. A junior academically, I was a senior in the Corps, right. junior academically, and um, there there she was at about that time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we lived in So you all have been married 60 years, or almost 60 years? When did you get married? We got married on Valentine's Day in 48. Oh, so okay, so you've been married for 60 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. A little over now. A little over now, yeah. Yeah. And uh, have four kids. Uh-huh. And two of them are Aggies and two of them are T-Sips. I see. The two older ones are T-Sips, rebelling oh. against the old man. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and grandkids? Yeah, I have 
grandkids? Um, yeah, we have um, four grandchildren and uh, three, no, wait a minute, what am I saying? Three grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. I'll be darn. How about that? That's great. And two, you had four kids, were they all boys or are they mm -hmm. all four boys, boys? Including uh, a pair of twins. I see, I see. And They're uh, the youngest? Yeah, the, the twins youngest. are the youngest. Uh -huh. I see, and they went to A&M? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Keith and Stewart. Wow. So. That's great, that's a great story. A great bunch of kids. Yeah. You got some pictures or some, uh, what, do you, what have you got there? Yeah, here are some. Uh -oh.